The world as you know it is over. The future is now, which is the only excuse why a couple of clowns like us could beam directly to you. The Mythwits! The show dedicated to all things geek pop culture, drenched in absurdity and coated with sarcasm. Every week we bring you an industry guest to talk about the ever-expanding Geekoverse and to play games with us. But we won't be playing a game today. Uh, we do our damnedest to be funny, but there are no guarantees, and this show is going to be a little more serious than usual. This is one of our new Mythwits Talk episodes. Uh, I'm your host, Peter Bryant. Joining me on this episode is my co-host, Mike Kafis. Can we talk? Can we talk? <laughs> We're going to talk. Can we talk? <laughs> our guest this hey, I'm week talking is, over here. <laughs> is Doc Joe Sweeney, returning guest. Good uh, Doc Joe G'day. is a game developer for Story Weaver games with such games as Rapture, Hail, Deniable, and High Space Second Edition. He is currently putting the finishing touches on a new horror tabletop RPG game tentatively called Slaughter. Joe is also an advisor, a technology strategist engaged in helping organizations and governments prepare for coming for the coming technology-driven workplace and social changes. He has a doctorate in education and technology from the University of Newcastle. Hey, man, bringing the IQ level up on this show. Don't yeah. uh, so, be uh, hot. <laughs> God, no. that's I agree totally. So, so uh, we're gonna have, we're gonna talk to Joe today about uh, about technology and where it's going and kind of um, what we kind of see happening in society because of it. We're kind of where society is going. Uh, again, as Joe said in the pre-show, we do not have a crystal ball. Nobody knows exactly what's going to happen or how it's going to affect things. Uh, but you know, if you do enough reading and and, and looking around and learning, uh, you get a kind of an idea where things are going. So, uh, so I brought Joe and he's an expert. He gives talks on this stuff. So I, and, and I like to read about it and, and hypothesize and pontificate about it on my Facebook page. If you follow me, so you've, you'll know, Oh God, here he goes with his science again. Uh, but, but I saw that Joe does this and I was like, Oh man, I gotta have Joe and talk about this. So, uh, and I like Joe, Joe's been on our show before and, uh, I've, I've had him, uh, he's, he's helped us out with Aethercon, uh, when I was help doing the Aethercon thing too. Uh, so I'm just, I'm just really happy to have him on here. So, so Joe, Joe, um, I, there's a lot of things to talk about where technology and where it's going, but I think one of the things that's really emergent, one of the things that's going to affect people uh, far sooner than I think most people realize, uh, and it's one my wife hates me talking about because I talk about it all the time, is self-driving cars, automated <laughs> automated <laughs> mobility. So, Joe, what, what do you see? Because I, I saw a video today, uh, uh, what is it, a level three self-driving car, which is higher, right. one level higher than Tesla. That and, was a level uh, four. I believe that was a level four. Oh, yeah. Was it a level on four? The, okay. that oh, that was yes. a level four. Right, yeah. right, right. I watched it on the way home. Yeah. So what happens oh, oh, when good. the car levels up? It, it, it does it like get new feet or something? I don't know. I th yeah, I think so. It's like feet not crashing, you know. <laughs> um, so yeah. So what what do you think? I mean, my thoughts on self driving cars are, are like there's a lot of jobs going to be disappearing. Yeah. So first of all, um, you know, I think it's really important to look at things like self driving cars in a broader context. The first one is that it's actually the natural outcome of an inflection point in the cost of compute, which makes uh, micro decision making, a form of automation, a form of AI, if you will, uh, possible. Now, less than 10 years ago, uh, some of the top researchers in the field of automation and AI were saying, we won't have self-driving cars for another two or three decades. You know, it was really just out of reach. Um, and when, our, when the CPU density, when the compute density, uh, drop below a certain point, a certain cost point, this becomes possible. Moore's law is slowing down. <laughs> That's probably a good thing. But if you do look at this, the compute power that we've got today to drive these cars will be probably close to doubled in a couple of years. So you're talking about level two, level three, level four. You know, that, that scale is not just one, two, three, four. It's a logarithmic scale. <laughs> And wow. so this will happen faster. And, and you know, people talk about, oh, the speed of change and so forth. Yeah, the technology really is speeding up. We're going to see a bit of a slowdown in the coming decade, but it's, it's still you know, much greater than the, than the rate of any tech we've had before. So self-driving cars are going to be here. In Australia, um, we've got the mining industry, which is using a lot of self-driving equipment. Um, it's safer. Uh, it's cheaper. 
uh, but it can also operate 24 hours a day, and these are expensive rigs. So this stuff is happening, and I don't think that people actually get how fast that technology is moving and how real this stuff will be. The question is, uh, will governments keep up with it? Will infrastructure keep up with it? Because, of course, you know, there's one thing to have the, the personal benefits of a self-driving car. If you're like me, I can't reverse park. I'm just... I'm awful. <laughs> I'm, I'm <laughs> awful. <laughs> you know, and I would just love a car that I can just push a button, park. But when you look across self-driving cars across an entire population, you go, we can now completely re-engineer how we think about road networks. These vehicles, we know we now we no longer need car ownership. Right. We can have car pickup. We can change the way that roads work. We can completely re-engineer um, traffic flows to optimize fuel consumption, all of this type of thing. These are the big, big changes. So we'll get self-driving cars, but our cities, our, our governments, our policies, these will take a lot longer to, to, to happen. Yeah. You know, it's, it's interesting because, um, in, you know, I don't, I don't know how, how often people think about, you know, how, how much stuff is built around the automobile, how downtown, mm. is built, or, you know, urban areas are built around the automobile. Um, you know, you think they're built around people, but in a lot of ways, that's not, that's not really true. They're really built yeah. around automation. Yeah. And, and look at food, food distribution, look at all the critical stuff, uh, water distribution, electrical distribution. We've got all that underground or overground that's done. But food distribution is still largely petrochemical based. It's it's vehicle based, mm -hmm. and um, that's not going to change anytime soon. Now, there's an area where self-driving, highly automated vehicles uh, will have a huge impact on. I think that'll be one of the first jobs to to be replaced by fully automated vehicles is 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 uh, food logistics because it's time critical. Uh, it's expensive, <laughs> and uh, let's face it, our supermarkets are always trying to drive down those costs to lift their profits. Right. Um, and on I, top of that, there's a big social burden um, because of that that distribution network. It's actually pretty tough on the drivers. I think that right. that's going to be one of the first areas that we're going to have self-driving vehicles is going to be the shipping industry. I, oh, I yeah. do agree with you on that. And uh, what was I watching that was um, – there were people oh, driving on the highway. Oh, it was um, uh, Marvel, Wolverine. Logan. It was Logan. Logan. Yep. Yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. yes. Yeah. So yes. I think that we'll be Great. seeing something like that where those things will be ultra uh, dense, uh, shielded so that, you know, if, if there's a crash that the, the goods will be OK. And I don't know, maybe there will be ultra um, they'll sacrifice themselves more so for someone, some idiot who is driving that gets in the way or something like that. Now, that's really interesting. I, I was having a discussion with this uh, with my son just the other night. He was showing me a YouTube video of an experiment known uh, it's known as the trolley experiment where oh, yeah. You've got, oh. uh, yeah. yeah now uh, that experiment should never have been done i would have you know, I, i've got some ethical issues around them actually doing that experiment that's another thing well i, I think it's but, a thought experiment i don't know if it's real no no the guy actually did the experiment he put someone in a train line and, and yeah a lot of that, a lot. <laughs> i forget the guy's name but anyway I, I have some serious issues with this um but it was riveting viewing even though it was making me angry but what was interesting is people think that the self-driving car issue, uh, one of the policy issues, is the trolley problem, which is if the car is going to have to swerve, it's going to hit, hit five people or one person, it would obviously be programmed to hit the one person. It would deviate safety. But what about the situation where the driver is in the car? Um, they have paid for the car. and They are at contract with the people who have made the car for them. And that car is carrying software that, given the choice of ramming them into a telegraph pole or killing two people on the road, it will kill the driver and destroy the car. What is the legal liability of that dilemma? Yeah. It's the same five trolley dilemma on the surface, naturally, kill the driver. Mm -hmm. But there's a commercial element to this, which the corporations are going to have to try and address. And the programmers who are, are teaching these computers or building these, these, these algorithms out are going to have to address this issue they can't address it without without legal protection. And so there's a there's a much more challenging issue around just thought experiments in this space. Well, and interestingly, what if the one person that the car might be programmed to kill would be that the driver's you know family member, as opposed to two people on the on the left who 
you know, they could care, well, you know, could care less about or whatever. I mean, that's, Ex yeah, exactly. You, you've got, and so what I'm saying is that th this will not, this, this is no longer a theoretical and it's ne not even a, a greater good issue. There is a commercial agreement about who dies. <laughs> There's an ethical quandary for it for the, for the new millennium. And it won't just be self-driving cars with this. There's a whole range of other AI-enabled technologies that have this dilemma. Well, at least for the car, I, I have I have somewhat of a solution to this because I've thought about this a lot. Um, <clears throat> I happen, you know, I happen to think that, and and and, and Joe, I think you'll agree with me on this this one that the biggest barrier to self-driving cars is going to be this trolley problem. That's the that's the biggest. I honestly think it's the biggest barrier. Not even the technology. The technology will keep coming, and but you know, this, because people don't trust machines to make decisions, they're like they're fine with a human making that decision because we are we're, we're we we don't, we're okay with people driving behind the wheel because that's what happens. A human does the trolley problem all the time. Oh, I see somebody mm -hmm. in the road. Do I swerve and hit a tree or do I hit the person? Oh, there was two people. Do they I hit this freeze. One or they the freeze other? and crash. <laughs> they freeze and crash is what they do, right? And they make a terrible. They make no decision. <laughs> So they make no decision so, most. Yeah. So, so I think I think the solution to this is, and, and and tell me what you think of this. You know, when you buy your car, when you sign this contract, and you you serve get this service, or however however you get into a self driving car, you have to complete a a questionnaire that say 250 questions, 250 trolley problems set up. What if it's, you know, two old people? What if it's an animal? What if it's, you know, whatever. And you go through and you make all these decisions given each situation. They give you 250 situations and you make the decisions. And basically what you have done is you've pre-thought how you would decide and then when you get in the car it does what you would do and that way it's not the machine's decision. It's making the decisions that you already told it to make. Joe, do Whatever you want to feel this you... one, or do you want me to get this yeah. one? No, 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 please join him, but I do have a strong opinion on this, but, but go for okay. it. I'm interested in all opinion. Well, no, what I'm thinking is, can you then be sued for a predetermined thought that, <laughs> thank you, see, can you be sued for a predetermined thought that you had the car make that you you were given the decision, uh, so who determines that legality? So, and, and I think that speaks to what Joe was saying before, but go ahead, Joe, you, you can probably yeah, and, 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 and the extension, that is absolutely correct, and the extension of that is then the corporation, which is being treated as a legal entity in this discussion, who wrote the original software, who has the actual contract. They're probably the ones who made you sign the contract. They are now culpable in yeah. this decision. They cannot escape that culpability. And so the, the, the issue around self-driving cars is going to be like all fundamentally you know, earth-shattering technologies that, that will change the nature of our society. It will be will be policy so the government needs to come in and they actually need to start saying in advance of this what are the political frameworks that that are viable in our culture so this will not be the same answer in every society uh what are then the legislative um uh, programs that we need to put in place now to start thinking about this um how do we engage the public in this discussion how do we engage enterprise in this discussion policy does not fit in the void um, so these techno policies need to be working on now because, quite frankly, the technology is ready. Um, you could have self-driving cars in most mid-sized American cities without much of a problem. Um, your roads are nice and big. You know, it, it, this is not a tech problem anymore. It is a, 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 it's definitely a policy problem. It's also a cultural acceptance. Uh, there is something fun um, about getting behind the wheel of a car and taking it for a spin. Um, I'm not too much into that, but my wife, oh my God, if I'm she not. could jump in a Lamborghini, she, she'd go for it. <laughs> I hate driving. So, you know, <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm not fussed with it, but you know, <laughs> I'm, I'm the family chauffeur. <laughs> right. I it's think funny I can solve I, that reverse parking problem. <laughs> I equated to, to commuting for so many years. I commuted, you know, hour and a half drive sometimes for years and years and years. And it really, it, it destroyed my joy of driving. Like I just, I'm just like, God, oh, cause I could be doing other things. I could be reading. I could be working on something that I want to do. I, you know, I could be watching a movie. I, you know, there's all these other things I'd rather do than to sit behind that wheel, like a robot driving it, you know? And yeah. I know we're terrible drivers. Humans are terrible drivers. We all are. No matter how good you are, you're a terrible driver compared compared to the, the driverless co or you know the driverless car. It drives a million times better than humans do. For the most part, yeah. Um, I, again, there are some blind spots that we still have with these vehicles, with the technology. But 
right. um, that it, it's it's going to evolve. And as we said, if we look at the compute power, and particularly around the the compute power which is needed for making these micro decisions, because the reason why we've got drive self driving cars is our compute power is now so dense it can make you know trillions of tiny little mm-hmm. uh, uh, decisions very quickly from a lot of input. Right. Um, as that continues to get more dense and you know, the price of that just falls per amount, then th- these vehicles are just going to get smarter. But also as they get more corpus, uh, more intelligence about actually how to drive, they will learn more and more and more. Those algorithms will then be uh, streamlined. Just, it's just going to get better and it'll, it'll literally be doubling every couple of years. So right. Fun times ahead for self-driving vehicles. Fantastic. All right. Well, hey, unless anybody else got anything else, let's, let's move on to the next piece of topic I have. Um, you know, it, it has a lot to do with, you know, so, so there's that portion of a technology that's coming. Another big portion is, uh, is automation. So like, um, mm. you know, there's all, jobs are being automated out. You know, there's, uh, yeah. one of the things that I saw recently, which I, I was really amazed at was a, there was a robot and it was building a house. It was laying brick. Mm. So we'd put the brick down yep. put the, the mortar down and put the brick down, tamp it into place and then go do the next one. And there was a guy watching it, maintaining it, but I, but that's only because it's new technology. At some point, that won't that won't even really be necessary. And this thing was just flowing through, just building this wall. And I'm thinking, you know, maybe a human could possibly keep up with this thing, but the problem is that this thing never has to stop. It could work all, it could work 24 hours a day and just keep building and building and building and building. And you know, so you, you, they they can they can build our houses. Uh, you know, you've got retail and fast food. You're not going to need people for that. I mean, a ro- AI, you know, automation uh, between AI and robots. And stuff. We've already seen totally that in China. If you, if, you, if you want to see what automation is doing, look at China. There's a real misconception, uh, particularly in, in U.S. media, um, in a lot of U.S. media that I see, um, that America lost its manufacturing to China because of cheap labor. Only partly true. America and Australia, for that matter, lost its its manufacturing sectors because of automation. And if you look at the mm. automation in China, it is phenomenal. Mm. Just absolutely, you've got factories the size of of, in some cases, small cities that are producing vehicles, producing whatever it is, and they only have, you know, dozens, not not thousands of people, uh, multiple dozens of people uh, overseeing this equipment. Um, this house building robot that you're talking about is absolutely one of those. Robotics is huge. Um, interestingly, in China, uh, one of their uh, convenience stores, equivalent of our 7-Eleven sort of thing, um, they have gone out of pilot of a completely um, checkoutless store. You will literally walk into the store. You have a little card that you tap the door as you go in. You take whatever you want from the shelf and you walk out. Right. And the cameras have recognized your face. They've mm-hmm. recognized what you've taken from the shelves uh, by image recognition and they charge you. And it is highly accurate. All they need is to stock those stores, which they do with robots as well. So you've got a situation where you'll have self driving cars taking produce to stores, putting it on the shelves and driving away. Not a human involved, well, very few humans involved. Um, and then the people just walking in and taking what they want. That is the future, and that is now. Holy um, shit. I, so what if I, I don't I have do any money? That, does the store know to no, it doesn't, the door? <laughs> it, well, well, interestingly, if you take a look at what Alibaba is doing in, in, in China, Alibaba is equivalent to their Amazon. Mm-hmm. Um, they roll out micro to people. Uh, they do money management. Um, it's basically a it, – it, it takes out the bank as the middleman. They will do loans up to two hundred thousand dollars based on what they know about how you are working within Chinese society. So this, Jeez. you would have heard this thing about the Chinese rating. Okay, oh all of that God. is is part of the, the economics. So, uh, and to think that China is a communist state, yes, it is, but it also has this very ultra capitalism, almost robber baron capitalism going on under the hood as well. Mm. So, if you want to look at where automation is going, look at China. It is, it is, it is, it is mind blowing what they're doing. Right. Um, on top of that, they're also going, uh, s- uh, striving for full zero carbon energy production by you know, 2030. Uh, they'll probably reach it earlier than that. Um, so, sorry, 2035. So you've got, you've got a country which is going to be going renewable energies, which is a huge uh, economic advantage. Um, they will have 
a cashless society. They'll have huge levels of automation. Their big issue is what to do with a, a still burgeoning population. Um, and continuing you probably growing regional uh, instability because there are other issues in the Asia Pacific region which they need right. to address. So oh, yeah. that's the future. That's that's one part of the future we get to look at. <laughs> right, right. So that's I mean that oh my god that is creepy because like like you were saying you know you have your your Seven Eleven type store. Um, and, and there are no people involved other than the people taking stuff from there. You know, the, the robots bring it to the store. They, they load up the shelves. You go buy it and, you know, AI handles your transaction. No people have touched anything except you, you know, and it's like there are no humans in that loop. I could well, just there, there, there definitely, there's definitely humans behind the scenes. I mean, let, but, but what's oh, no, no, behind the scenes, look at but it, not, look not at directly. The jobs, yeah. The jobs which are being ripped out of, of that type of chain, incidentally, that, that store that's announced that, they've planned 100 stores to open this year with this technology. Uh, the automated stocking is is a bit down the roadmap, so I, I want to set the, the scene correct on that. That's not happening okay, today, right, right. But, the t but they've already been prototyping these stores. They are running. Um, now, you look at the jobs that have been ripped out of that. They're all low-level uh, manual labor. So mm -hmm. anything to do with manual labor will be the first thing stripped out because manual labor is relatively expensive, even in a country like China, um, you know, where we, the, the general civil consensus around China is it's low cost. No, it's not low cost because of low cost labor. In the cities, labor is now probably um, is higher than some parts of America. Um, mm -hmm. It's that's that's not evenly spread. Don't don't overquote me on that one. But it's <laughs> right. not a cheap yeah. it's not a cheap labor market. China is now outsourcing to places like Vietnam, Malaysia, and so forth. China is now getting the outsourcing market because of labor costs. Um, oh my God! So China's outsourcing to cheaper people. <laughs> oh God, yeah, yeah, they've wow. been doing that for ten years. Yeah, gosh, wow, yeah. Um, that's amazing. It's 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 a it's phenomenal. Um, they're also now making their own robots and designing their own robots. That's the other thing which we need to look for. So, you know, when we talk about robotic automation, my bet would be that China will be the juggernaut in that space. Previously, it's been Europe, you know, the, uh, certainly the, the, the Germans, uh, and America with a lot of really good software. But we're now seeing software that writes robotic automation software. Yeah. Um, yeah. Here in, I, 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 I was in a, um, a think tank recently where uh, Wollongong University, <laughs> this is not a university that you'd normally think would have this sort of stuff. The couple of young guys stood up and showed how they can take a CAD drawing. So give it to a designer, draw it up. They then give that to their software, which is a software robot that then writes the software code to program machine robots to build it. So this thing looks oh. at the drawing, figures out how these, these other robots would need to move, would need to operate, uh, would need you know, what the track lines would look like, designs the whole thing. That's a task that used to take six months. They can now do yeah. it in 10 minutes. It's just, you know, we're automating automation. <laughs> right. So. You, that was that was something, um, that was another point, you know, as, as part of this automation is, is the AI is the other half. You know, you got robots and stuff, but the, the, autom oh. the AI, you know, they're, oh my God. So AI is going to replace accountants. It's going to replace programming because now as i understand i'm not a programmer but one of the guys i was talking to is uh he said yeah now programming's become kind of like um you, there's it's, visual block programming now where you can you you mm -hmm. start where what you what you where you are and where you want to be and you'll be able to tell ai look i want to program basically say i want a program that'll do this and it'll actually just take blocks and put a program together like legos and so ai will be designing software so you won't need, you know, they say, oh, well, because I've heard, well, an AI and, and you know, and, and robots come around. I'll just become a programmer and I'll be OK. It's like, nope, mm, sorry. Nope, there nope, will, nope. <laughs> there will be is... programmers, but they won't be as plentiful as you'd like to think. No, they won't exactly. be. I know I've been, uh, I was in, this was maybe even eight or nine years ago, I was interpreting at a university for a computer science master's level class. And they were talking back then about not only the existing technology, but what was coming and what is like here now. And that is things like 
the requirements gathering phase is what you were talking about, Pete. You can just say, all right, I need a program that is going to take user input on these things, and then it's going to take that and put them in, into tables and organize this stuff and then output some data and tell the user what they need or how much it's going to be or whatever the software. It, there's, um, there's the end user, there's the designer, and then there's the computer um, the computer aided, yeah, the, and the computer aided um, software writing that's going on now, and it is, it, it's a whole other software suite of writing. You can say, I need this designed in um, Cobalt, or I need this designed in C plus plus, and that that sophisticated software writing program will write it. It'll figure out what it needs to do, and then figure out which language that you want it to be written in, and do it. And that is like. To me, that is crazy. That is virtually. I mean, it's it's interesting. I, I actually wrote one of those systems uh, almost twenty years ago. Uh, admittedly, much more rudimentary, a lot slower. Yeah. Um, I I come from a software dev background. I'm one of these people that as, as I'm a self-taught technologist. Um, my first computer um, was a Southwest six hundred nine mil that the size of this room. <laughs> it's a long story. But what is interesting is when we were writing procedure, and and this is part of a natural evolution because of Moore's law, because of the density of compute power. And by the way, uh, I really hate using the term AI because most people don't actually know that it's a whole bunch of very different things. But let's use it for the purpose of this discussion. Um. When we had procedural, pure procedural programming languages like COBOL uh, or even roll your own languages like Fortran, what we, what we were finding is that as the program got bigger, as the process that we were trying to automate, because that's all that programming is, mm -hmm. it's automating a process, uh, an information process, some cases a real world process, but it's automation. Um, once we got to a certain level of complexity, the code became very difficult to maintain. So you you know you didn't know what Bob or Sally had written six months ago because they've left the company and documentation doesn't do enough of that because you've got to know where in the documentation you need to find this information. It's been a perpetual problem. So then we created object orientation and um, for those of you who aren't programmers, object orientation was an attempt to make programming more real world like. Um, mm -hmm. It was actually pioneered by people like Timothy Leary. So, yeah. Right. Nice. <laughs> nice. Uh, he was definitely involved in teaching children uh, um, how to create uh, artificial ecosystems with object-oriented programming. It sounds wild, but we're talking 25 years ago, almost 30 years ago. It was a great time. And so that became the dominant programming language, uh, sorry, programming paradigm. Multiple languages were retrofitted to, to make it. And we still have the same problem today that we had then, which was uh, you can be very productive in creating a program. But it's very hard to maintain that, which is why every five, seven years, we basically throw out all the old stuff that we did and retrofit a whole bunch of new stuff. Um, what we're now recognizing with the new tools that you're talking about, there was an attempt to do those tools in the uh, early 90s. Uh, we called it RAC, Application Development. Mm -hmm. And not much has changed except we now do have much more compute power so we can you know, spec out a process of a particular type and this thing will use those blocks of code, those templates to generate the final program. But this is where things get really interesting, where you don't use programming anymore. You use uh, contextual um, development and this is true AI. So if you think about the chat bots that you see in Facebook and so forth, um, most people use them very, very poorly, but when you do them really well, what will happen is you will say to the chatbot or to Alexa or the Google Home, you'll say something. It will use uh, an algorithm to figure out what was the context of what you were saying. So natural English to context. Now notice that's an algorithm. That's not what we typically think as programmers as a program. It's an algorithm that makes a best guess and returns a bunch of data based on that best guess. Then the programmer has a little bit of code there that says, if this context, then do these other things that we know are the re typical responses to this context. M Google switched there. If you think about Google and the search engine, Google has, there's no way a programmer can figure out every single search term that someone's going to type into Google. So they use this contextual idea. It's not programming as we know it. It is true AI. It's, it's what we call um, contextual linguistic AI. That is going to be the future. And I think the people who know how to 
create textual uh, and linguistic solutions will be the hot demand for the coming 10 years. After that, that job is gone as well. So pretty soon we won't we won't have coders. We won't have people who program AI. It's it's, it's going to be skin pick, uh, very thin pickings in in my business. That's for sure. Yeah. Well, wow. and I, I think it's all going to be wonderful until one day Google, Alexa, or who or even Siri doesn't want to open the pod bay doors. Then we're truly screwed. <laughs> right. Sorry, I, I can't do that. Come on, Alexa, <laughs> buy me some toilet paper. I'm sorry, but your allotment of toilet paper, you must have a bowel issue. I have scheduled uh, an appointment uh, for a doctor. This is the, this is the other <laughs> interesting thing that's coming up. Toilet paper. I use this example a lot, <laughs> not for not, oh, wow. not having it. But what happens? What happens when you say to Alexa or one of these other computers, um, "Put toilet paper on my shopping list," or "Buy me toilet paper"? Which brand of toilet paper does it get? Ah. Who, right. who pays the most money to make sure that when you give, because humans talk fairly loosely. We, we're not Vulcans, unfortunately. We're very imprecise. So when we start talking, when we move to this new paradigm of, of working with our computers, which will be verbal, um, we will be talking to them in an imprecise way. And the context that has been created to understand that, which has been programmed, if you will, in this, this AI sense, somebody has control over what that, how that will interpret. So it could be that the biggest brands get to basically block out the smallest brands because humans don't talk to their computers in, in, a, in a standardized way. This is a real okay. concern. And we're already seeing this on Facebook and, and other channels of, of advertising. Uh, the big players are just pushing out. You know, the idea that the internet is a level playing field, that's disappearing fast. And with right. the net neutrality issue going on in the moment in the States, that's even going to shrink further. So perhaps we're coming to the end. You know, there's a real risk that we're coming to the end of internet innovation. Oh, don't say it so, Joe. Say All because of toilet so. paper. All, All because of toilet paper. paper. God damn, it's always, right. always in that end of things, isn't it? I thought it was the death of net neutrality, but damn, if it wasn't toilet paper. It's the death it's, of toilet there's a whole bunch of stuff. <laughs> Yeah, which the three shells? What about the, the, the toilet the paper? Is shells? a really useful metaphor for this. Hmm. Right. <laughs> oh no, oh, the Running Man. <laughs> right. <laughs> I love All right, so, so, much. I still love that. so, uh, you know, and and you could three D print just about anything nowadays, oh. and it's getting better and better and better. We just got a three D printer at work that is the most uh, is the greatest three D printer I have ever seen. I mean, I'm just like. Oh man, we are really getting here. We're getting here. It is, you know, like so. So normal three D printers, they they print level by level, and you get what they call st styrations. So you'll see the you'll see the levels. You can see them, uh, kind of like when you when you cut a tree and you can see the rings in it. Same thing with that. This one you can't see that. It's nice and um, it's nice and clean. It uses a different process. It doesn't print bottom up. It prints top down. It's interesting. Cool. Um, cool. And it also um, it, it also can print. A lot more, uh, a lot more materials. So it's it's. Uh, I mean, it's plastic, but it's the 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 grade of plastic uh, has this really wide range now. There's this really soft stuff, and this really like, and and the stuff that it's printing that it's hard plastic is like a really durable hard plastic. These are parts you could actually use. Um, you know, like when you when you open up your your say your your washing machine, your dishwasher, and you've got little plastic gears in there sometimes and stuff. You could literally now with with this printer, you could print plastic gears that you could put in there and use. Whereas some of the the three D printed materials earlier, some of the earlier stuff wasn't quite strong enough to do that kind of stuff. And and if if a piece got big enough and you put enough stress on it, where the uh, stri styration stri styrations 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 are, it could crack along that. That was like a weak point. And now now that's going away um we have 3d metal printers at work um yeah, and they're talking what when are you going to be able to print me a new liver because i've pr pretty much pickled mine well it's coming it's they coming it's bones. coming soon it's coming too <laughs> they hurry have, up they, they actually have, on, um, on that one i can't do that? a liver can't do a liver yet then i know but but i was again at that um that innovation uh, awards evening that i attended uh, there was a, another Australian company that's going to China. They're going to do all of their, their final work in China. They print um, out of a special new material which they've developed. They print discs, spinal discs. Um, nice. So they can, and, and they can just keyhole surgery those. They, they scan what you've got. They repair it back to what they think it should be. They make these things, insert them, and, and you're theoretically as good as new. <laughs> so, you know, 
that medical 3D printing is absolutely here. Um, right. Uh, printing meshes for, for brain injury is another one which I, I have uh, read about, which is freaky. <laughs> right. Growing your brain into a, into a 3D printed mesh. Now, there's some very yeah. interesting things on the horizon in that space. Well, well check this Livers, out. So, Mike, you, sure. you said, well, they're co- it's coming. It's coming. I'll tell you what they do. They have figured out there's this process. I don't know if it's works with livers. I know they did it with a heart. They figured out there's a way to dissolve all of the muscle tissue off the heart, so everything off of it, and it leaves behind this like generic protein scaffolding, and yeah, it has, it has no um, DNA signature to it, so your body won't reject it. It's it's kind of inert, and then they take your stem cells, and repopulate that heart. Uh, from from stem cells from your stem cells so it's your heart and it's brand new it's like like brandy new and then they, they'll be able to put that back in you now they haven't perfected that yet but they've come a long way on it and it's coming and that's that's not really a 3d printed heart that's actually a different process but they were trying to print uh, organs but it's that's really complex because you gotta you have to print the vessels in and all that kind of stuff and it's just not there and I don't think that's gonna be the process I think it's gonna be stem cells for that but that's just amazing it's common yeah. it's it's really this is stuff that's like I mean it's like really on the horizon there it's not just it's conceptual coming, they're actually of, doing it yeah the, 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 this is stuff which is definitely working and, and the other part of this now th- this is where you know we, we've talked about a lot of technology possibilities here and they're all very exciting but there's a social aspect to all of this stuff now, that's all wonderful stuff if you can afford it. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm not going to get into, you know, the, the universal health coverage debate, or whatever. We're actually talking about, though, issues here about who lives longest because right. these will be in the interim until they are completely and utterly automated and completely commercialized and the cost comes down as the, as the production rates go up. Uh, these will only be for a very limited number of people. Um, and so, you know, there is, there are, there's always been discussions around who gets first treatment, but we're reaching a stage now where uh, we understand telenome treatments. Uh, we've got some great, ex- sorry, I'm talking about eight life extension here. Life extension, yeah. Um, we we understand that we can print or repair bodies with with stem cells. We now know that works. We've, uh, I think it was just last week or the week before last, I read a quick article. I only scanned it. I didn't read it thoroughly. I've got to confess that uh, someone's vision has been restored based on stem cell work on, on the optical nerve. Mm-hmm. So these things which are, you know, they're coming out of the lab. They're, they're going to come into mainstream society. Who gets that? Who gets that first? And if we're dealing with taking somebody's, I, I did a project many years ago where I was, I was working on behalf. I was a technology consultant into a project that said, what is the ramifications of life extension on the insurance industry, on the life insurance oh, industry. Right. Uh, and we, we calculated, but well, they, the insurance company calculated that the average lifespan, if we did not age, uh, if we could stop the aging process, the average person would, would live to about 400 to 450 years, about 400 years. And then, you know, a piano would fall on us or we'd <laughs> get into an accident with a self-driving car or something. You know, but, but <laughs> we actually even weren't looking at self-driving cars. So that's, that's a lie. But, but you get the idea. It was about 400 years. What was interesting is when we, we had an economist on the panel as well, and they started saying, what happens to the property market? Mm-hmm. So we right. have an Australia, a very, a very age-concentrated property market. And if right. you want to get a house in Australia and you're under 30 years old, you're basically out of luck, or you're moving deep, deep, deep out to the bush. Um, you know, so these are cultural, you know, these, are, these have an issue around a particular society. It's different in America, I understand that. But you look at all of those technologies aggregated that we're talking about, less entry-level work, almost no manual labor. Most of the service industry will be automated to invisibility, including programming. Um, there are some professions which are relatively protect against this, but not a lot. And then people living a hell of a lot longer with a higher quality of life potentially, right. if they have the money. And you've got the money if you're old enough to have got your own house or had property right. investments. And so all of a sudden you've got this, this real rapid stratification of, of, of society in less than a generation. We are probably approaching that tipping point. More right. than the AI singularity, I think this is the big one. And I, I talk yeah. about it as being the tipping point between William Gibson's view of the unit of the world and uh, you know, Gene Roddenberry's view of the right. world yeah. and Star yeah. Trek. Yeah. We're really coming to the, to the push comes to shove on that. I think... Um, uh, I think that countries like China and Japan 
um, are recognising that, the their governments are recognising that because they do have rapidly ageing populations uh, for very different reasons. Um, they have high levels of automation, and they have high levels of renewables. Those countries might, and they have also much more consolidated political power, so it's less of a rift. I think those countries are the ones that will be able to navigate through this real challenge that we've got easier than, say, what we're seeing in America at the moment, which is, quite frankly, comes across as a very divided country. It's like a shitstorm is what it is. All right, Mike? <laughs> <laughs> Your words, not mine. <laughs> I'm being Dang, political. I'm American. I'll tell it straight. It's, it's a shitstorm. No, listen, listen. It was not the most pleasing view of humanity, but so what? What is wrong with the Wally outlook of, of the world? Wally. Remember? I've never seen that. I've never seen it. Oh, oh okay. You should. It's beautiful, so meeting. Basically, okay. humans have gotten to the point where all they do are they're fat and they go around on hovering boards and eating and just being served by robots and stuff. I mean, that's I'm basically okay that. what we're talking about. I mean, I'm kind of okay I'm with it, okay too. With that. Kinda well, okay. I kind of got a head start. That, so. that, 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 is, that is okay. But, but you know, I, what, Wally was great. But if you actually look at Wally carefully, what sort of society, what is the economic structure of the society that allows that to happen? It looks a hell of a lot like Marxism. Mm -hmm. So production is now so automated, but that production is literally a social, socially owned good. It's not owned by a corporation or a single government body or whatever. It is, it's, it, you've got a middle class that's, whose entire um, lifestyle um, if you will, or, or standard of living has been increased at a similar rate. The problems emerge and societies fail uh, all through history when your middle class starts to shrink and you get too much stratification of wealth, okay. of technology availability, of medical care, of all of these things. This is well documented. Um, I have the dubious... Um, um, <laughs> I basically predicted the rise of a Trump or a Trump-like character based on what I was seeing from the American um, wealth distribution. Uh, when, we, when we developed uh, the game called um, Rapture, we spent a lot of time, about two years, analysing history, military, economic history, and then trying to predict 600 years forward. No. And part of that was, and it was a very detailed, you know, literal timeline, what would be the little possible scenarios? And one of the scenarios that comes up is, of course, the resource wars. There will be a crunch where renewables are significantly cheaper than oil, but the oil industries, uh, right. all of the roads, all the stuff that we've got around that has to break down, and that causes unrest. But even with that, you still need petroleum products. Mm -hmm. um, you know, even with renewables, we're going to need petroleum products. So... There's also rare earth metals <laughs> that, you know, in our phones and whatnot. These are going to these are going to be harder to get. So we we come up to a point where um, economies start to fail. But even before that, we were saying that there are certain economies who have shrinking middle classes who are going to start to go into economic and political turmoil. A um, couple of years after that, the GFC hit, um, sort of on target with our timeline. <laughs> Whoops. Right. Uh, and, and as part of that research, I realized that America was very likely to see the rise of a demagogue. And I don't mean that in a negative sense. A demagogue has a particular uh, rationale. It's somebody who will talk to the masses and tell them what they want to hear. Right. That is the whole policy. And that's what you saw in, in, in Donald Trump. He, he's, uh, he's a brilliant demagogue. Um, whether you like his policies or dislike them or not, he does know how to play the crowd. Mm -hmm. And... Then you've got, okay, um, is the power base that a demagogue builds around them based on nationalism, based on religion, based on some form of, you know, extreme political uh, worldview, um, you know, ultra-communist, ultra-nationalist, um, religious leaders. We see those all through the world now. There is the rise of the demagogue. We are living in the rise of the demagogue. Unfortunately, the next stage of that, based on the work that we did with the Rapture, is brush fire wars, followed by some pretty damn hot wars. And when I look at Korea, and bear in mind, I spent 20 years living in Hong Kong and de dealing with that part of the world quite extensively. Um, I'm going, yeah, <laughs> Korea's a basket case. <laughs> There's a real danger we're going to go to war with Korea sometime right. in the next decade. Yeah. But, sorry, and bad I'm, news. I'm, bad news. Yeah, no, no. <laughs> and, 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 you know, what, what's also concerning is, is that, you know, it's, it's not just with Trump, 
it's not just uh, his political party, whatever the hell that is anymore, because you know it's not really Republican anymore. It's what, whatever whatever they have become. Um, is that it? Also pushes the Cheeto, the Cheeto party. Well, it also pushes the other side in, in the other direction, and I'm I am very concerned that you know we're going to have a lot of teeter totter that's going to just get more extreme and more extreme. It's it's shoving the the um, the Democrats more into the uh, direction of communism. You know, I mean, it's it's or a, a, a overly strong sense of, um, of 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 liberalism. You know, uh, and I'm yeah. it's worrisome. Ooh, they're, they're, yeah, uh, it's interesting because we've seen the opposite thing happen in Australia. Um, I, I get where you're coming from with that. It's a, it's, it's an interesting thought. Um, the we've got both sides of the political spectrum. We've got Labor, which is equivalent of your you know, liberals, if you will, <laughs> and we've got the Liberal Party, which is definitely your conservatives. And they're both moving towards uh, the more um, conservative edge. You know, in Australia, um, we have some of the most bizarre internet laws on the planet. Um, every ISP has to keep every single internet address that every citizen has gone to and every location they have been to based on their smartphones for two years. And they can be accessed not just by the police, warrant, warrantless access by the police, but a whole bunch of other government departments. You know, who the hell has, which, country, which modern country has that? So we do see this shift of both political spectrums um, towards this uh, potentially dystopian future. So I do worry about this. Ultimately, it comes down to, though, if you've got a middle class which is, is well off, in other words, the bulk of your society, if it can afford to feed itself, it can afford, you know, afford to have its kids go to school and all those important things, it's not a problem. As soon as that starts to shrink, you've got a problem. China's problem is that its middle class is growing, has been growing so fast that growth is now slowing, and the people who are still on the outskirts of, of the boon that China has seen in the last 20 years they're now becoming marginalized and given that they are some tens of millions of people you know that's a big issue for china to try and address they have a centralized government which is dead scared of revolution so they're going to make sure that those people are bought into that middle class you don't have that in some of the more advanced societies australia us uh, interestingly in europe a lot of those countries are what americans would consider more socialist mm -hmm. they don't have this problem as much because they you know they knowingly make sure that that middle class is stable. This is all about national stability more than political rhetoric. And I think that's what we often gets lost in this debate. The technology aspect of this is the incoming wave of automation. If you do not share the benefits of that incoming automation across that middle class and that starts to shrink faster, you're going to have an unstable society and it will lead to some strange results and, and, right, yeah. and dire ones potentially. I'm very concerned with that, and one of the things I brought up uh, before that, that I had some people on, on social media, of course, th these are hot. Some of these are hot, really hot button, uh, especially the, the the idea of base income. Uh, it's it's mm. very hot button, uh, but I take it from a different point of view. I, I'm not saying you know when I when I bring it up and I say that we may have to go to some system of base income. I'm not saying it because it's a political thing. I want to give people rights. It's not has nothing to do with that. It has everything to do with. This shit is coming, right? Yeah. Automation's taking jobs away. There are going to be people who cannot, they have nothing, they have no job, they have nothing to do. And it's not going to be just a few people, it's going to be a lot of people. Uh, do I want to live in a country, do I want to live in a country where um, people are starving to death on the streets? Because if you don't No, they won't, they, them, won't. They, they won't starve to death on the streets. That will be for a very, very short amount of time. People, when they're hungry, what's the, what's the natural thing when you're starving and you can't feed your child? What would you do? You kill your neighbor for their food, or you rob the you store, anarchy. or you revolt. Or you you get store. anarchy. Yeah, whatever. That's what I'm saying. You get you get total anarchy. Exactly. Because because I can tell you as a parent, and we are all parents. Uh, tell me if if you wouldn't do the same thing. If uh, if my kid was starving, I would take food from you to feed my kid. I, oh, I'd just I eat my kid. Oh, actually, I'd probably eat your kid first. <laughs> yeah. Right, that's what I'm saying. Yes, exactly. I would <laughs> feed my kid. I would feed my kid your kid. Right. <laughs> <laughs> No, I'm being, no, this I'm, is a I'm, great I'm, idea for a new role-playing game. I right, think, right. By the way, exactly. remember, Australia is the country that invented Mad Max. So <laughs> right, <have> exactly. <laughs> but uh, you know, and I'm I'm being crazy here. I'm 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 I'm, I'm exaggerating, obviously. But the, no, the point of the matter is, 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 is that's where <laughs> it, it, it's 
it kind of goes. It kind of goes that way. And, yeah. um, yeah. you know, and I'm, I'm cons- but, the, the, the big concern with that is, is that once that starts, once we start going down that road, it's going to spiral out of control. Um, they fall very start fast. Getting, Soci- you get, society's fall very fast. Because here's, right. here's the problem. You know, you th- once automation breaks down, because that's what's going to happen, you know, any kind of automation with people where they're involved, once that starts to break down, people start starving to death because they can't get food. You know, mm-hmm. and then once people start starving, to oh man, that shit goes crazy. I mean, and then you get disease, and then disease spins out of control, which then complicates everything else. Um, you know, it, it it's going to get good, ugly. Yeah. And, and and the typical way that this thing is he- historically, the typical way that this is headed off is countries go to war. Yeah. Um, and we see this throughout the Middle East now. Um, they're going to war with themselves, but you know, there is turmoil. Um, but you also see it with, um, you know, the saber rattling that goes on and all, um, and also that the outward looking for the other. So this is, this is stuff which has happened time and time and time again. It's not new. What we're going through at the moment may feel new because it's new technology and so forth. Right. What's really interesting is we, we know where the tech is going. It's really easy to predict where tech is going. How society reacts to that tech is very mm-hmm. difficult. Um, one of the best exercises that I, I encourage everyone who's listening to this to do is go and find a YouTube video called Eve 2000. It's a 1930 newsreel. Uh, it's on YouTube. takes a little bit of time. Watch it. Okay. And while watching it, ask yourself, uh, what technology did they nail for the year 2000? Uh, and I presented okay. this to, to to government audiences and trade delegations and so forth. And and it's funny because people are just laughing their heads off through this about seven minutes of, you know, what fashions would look like in the year 2000. And, and it's it's hilarious. And so at the end of it, I say, okay, everybody, what technology did they get right? And everyone just says, oh, my God, they got everything right, really. And then I say, okay, what did they get wrong? And the only people who put up their hands are women and people of color. Hmm huge change in those 37 years oh, sorry those 70 yeah. years yeah yeah so so what we what we need to do is we need to know you know we can people like me i can say pretty much when um artificial uh, scan of a brain will reach a point where we can actually take someone's brain and put them into consciousness we're probably about 30 years away from that but that's that's going to be here when can we when will we likely have life extension it's probably here already uh, yeah. i'm talking about anti-aging it's probably here already uh getting it out of the labs and into humans is a whole other issue <laughs> um <laughs> yeah. cloning is already here we know cloning. so you know there's a whole range of tech that we can very accurately pre- predict um artificial consciousness is another one which is probably about 45 maybe a little bit earlier so actually i personally think it's around 37 but you know everyone's got an opinion but these are big big changes big tech what we don't know is what will this do to society? Because so much of that depends on how society chooses to react. Right. And that comes to leadership. It comes to education. Um, at the recent Adobe um, think tank session, um, at the very end of the session, all these panelists included people who are you know, engineers who built mind-controlled wheelchairs, Dr. Jordan, um, people who are neural scientists looking at how we interact with technology. You know, an, an amazing group of people, plus myself, we were all asked to sum up what we think we should do. And most of the participants were talking about politics. They were talking about the fact that leadership needs to be very aware of these issues. My comment was teach your children, read it to your children when they are infants from the age of zero to six, read to them 30 minutes every day, three times a day, 10 minutes each time, three books each time. That will stand your child in really good stead. We know this from 45 years worth of neural um, research and educational research that will stand in really good stead to be very flexible to move between different roles and different jobs and different fun- modes of thinking. Uh, there's a physiological change that happens when you read nursery rhymes, read storybooks to your children. So we literally, you know, we're doing the wrong thing by giving our kids iPads now. <laughs> but we've right. got this huge change coming up that we just don't know what it's going to look like because our humans, the humans that we're raising now, probably aren't being given the right mindsets, the right tools to make long-term decision-making. And then you've got countries like you know, the, the, the Chinese, they have five-year rolling plans, then they have 50-year rolling plans, then they have 500-year rolling plans. <laughs> so wow. That's our competition. <laughs> and, yeah. Yeah. Can I offer, uh, it's not exactly a, 
a, a exact prediction of what society will be like. But I'm thinking that, you know, the reason feudalism ended was because of land-based economies became money-based, you know, trade-based and money um, actually had a value. And that's what we kind of, we turned it into a capitalistic type of economy. I'm wondering if in some ways a tech-based economy will replace capitalism in some way. We won't, I mean, I can't even foresee it. And I mean, I don't know, Joe, I mean, have you foreseen <laughs> it in some way? Look, uh, actually, in, in the Rapture book, um, we actually do talk about that. Um, there are a number of newly formed political powers. One of those is the Sino-Africana bloc. Um, and they are by far and away the most politically and most technologically advanced culture. Interestingly, um, uh, and the reason it's the Sino-Africana bloc is China is investing very heavily in Africa at the moment to get access to the rare earth metals they need to continue their technological mm -hmm. progress. Uh, but unlike unlike the colonial powers who went in, they are investing mm -hmm. in Africa. So there's a very different mindset. You know, they really do see it as the future. Um, so that's one group that grew out of this. Um, and they have this odd um, blend of, you know, communism type roots, but ultra capitalism on the inside. Um, and this is something that was actually put into practice uh, under Deng Xiaoping about oh, 20 years ago. So, you know, there, there is a, there is capitalism in China, ultra capitalism, probably, probably more competitive and certainly faster than, than what we see happening in, in even places like Silicon Valley. It's really aggressive and dangerous. It can be very dangerous to do business in China if you're not careful. But you've got, at the same time, they've got this protectionist worldview about protecting China interests. Hence, you can't get Google in China very easily. Um, and Alibaba has grown to massive proportions as a, as a result of that protectionism. So if you take that into the future uh, with this sort of uh, cradle to the grave, technological tracking of citizens, um, huge use of automation and AI, um, absolute paranoia about uh, revolution cropping up from dissatisfaction of your people. Very interesting society and probably one that's going to be, I would, I would argue they will be surpassing uh, all of the other major economies within the next possibly decade. So it's not far away. Um, they're, they're, they're slowing down a little bit, which is good. And they're, they're trying to pull the brakes on their economy, but, then you've got um, other economies that are um, less controlled about, you know, looking at the society as a whole and more controlled, uh, more looking at the individual and this, this idea of ultra capitalism where, you know, you can make it if you try hard enough. They, they, they suffer very bad. I suspect that they will have a much harder time with this transition to a highly automated, highly technological society. And, and remember, cash is going to disappear. Cash has already gone in places like Hong Kong. Uh, cash is insanity in, in this world when you think about it. Yeah, absolutely, it's dying. So you've got those 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 societies. Interesting. Those societies tend to also be ones which have got a lot of, carrying a lot of debt. Right. Um, so you know that's not a good combination where you lack the ability. You, you've got a strong, you've got a strong stratified economy. Um, you've got lots of technology taking out the middle class, the traditional middle class roles. Uh, and I know I'm sounding a bit like a political professor here. I apologize. <laughs> but I, do view this, I view this solely from the point of view of, you know, what could the future look like for my gains? Um, uh, but also advisory to, to some governments because they've got to think of these issues. And then you ask yourself, okay, what are the roles that are left? Who, who rises to the top in that environment and so forth? What does capitalism look like? It's pretty clear that capitalism that we have today, which is really, it's not Keynesian capitalism. It's, it looks a hell of a lot more like um, corporatization is a word that's been used to describe it. Uh, it's not as competitive as true capitalism uh, was first envisioned because you've got mega organizations that control big swathes of, of, of our economy. In Australia, 80% of our grocery um, uh, purchasing and production is controlled by two companies. 80%. It's huge. Mm. So nice. you know, where does competition sit in that environment? <laughs> so these are all the big, big issues. Um, I suspect that, that, you know, there are advantages to being uh, to having a socialist worldview 
in a highly technological future. There are advantages to that to the middle class, not necessarily to the established you know, uh, industry owners. Um, that transition, I, I, I just can't see how it's going to happen in some countries without a lot of struggle and tension. And I suspect that's what you're beginning to see in, in America at the moment with the, the rifts, uh, the, the, the very clear political rifts happening. You, know, you were mentioning this more liberal on one side and more conservative on the other side. All right, hey Joe, Joe, I got to talk to you about this all day, but we're going, we're going kind of long on this. Let's, uh, let's squeeze in some gaming talk real quick. Let's make it quick because uh, I, I, you know, we're trying to keep our shows from being too awful long. Um, but, but we want to talk just a tiny bit about, um, you know, science fiction, science fiction versus science fantasy because you are a game designer and you have to think about these things because games yeah. that are, are you know, like like really political and, and very realistic aren't generally a whole lot of fun um, or they can be but for only the right people um, but, but you got to you know you got to insert some you got you got to insert some fun but you were saying that you know uh, why why is a science fantasy closer to science fiction than, than, than we think okay well first of all um, it's really interesting when we designed I mentioned Rapture a few times in this game uh, Rapture is really hard science fiction. Uh, everything in that book has been, you know, has come from base principles. Uh, a lot of scientists worked on it, quantum physicists, you know. We, we put a lot of time getting all the tech right, all the way down to the photonic teleportation arrays and the, uh, that's a communication system, not Star Trek. All of this was real, except for one thing. As soon as you go into science fiction, uh, it, certainly space-bound science fiction, you get into discussions around faster than light travel. Yeah. Or humans in space. Right, right. I got bad news for us. <laughs> humans are not built for space. So we're no. going to get into space. Um, it's not going to be in this big meat, wet meat sack form. Now, we did some hand waving in Rapture. We created a concept of uh, gravity control where people can build gravity drives and build singularities around their spaceships so they could go superluminal speeds. It's total crap. And what's right. funny is that when we published this game, um, we've had people write in complaining about some of the tech. It is in, in its heart a horror game. Um, it takes the premise of, you know, if all of this hard science is real, what would also happen if the Bible as written, but I'm not going to tell you which version of the Bible was real and the rapture happens on earth, but not in space, only on earth because that's how it's been written. Um, <laughs> what then, what other than, how does society break down and so forth? Um, what is the horror element? So it's sort of like Event Horizon, you know, the game. Right. Um, what was interesting is we got people writing in complaining about all sorts of things. Uh, there is use of nanotechnology, which is very much frowned upon because it's freaking dangerous. Um, yeah. People writing, oh, I could never do that, never do that. And I went, well, actually, I told the guy who, who advised on that, a guy called Ray Jewell, who you've spoken with, he, he, he wrote 12 pages of here's the history of nanotech and here's the future history of it. You're wrong. <laughs> Right. <laughs> so all of that was right. But the faster than white travel stuff is complete and utter bollocks. You know, I just had to pull a Star Wars, you know, Star Trek science mumbo jumbo get, out. You can't okay. get people to other planets that easily without just going, well, this thing exists. Magic. You know, Magic. we have to, you have to, because if you, if you stick with the science, it's just not, it's just not happening. We're not, or, we're not going to, or you know, we change our form yeah. significantly. And literally, right. we become some sort of weird cyborg computer thing, uh, an AI, human intelligence embedded in an AI or something. It, I, I just can't see any other way of actually doing that. Uh, we'll even with drive that, yeah. <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> but He's then, a you know, on the, an envoy of the human race. <laughs> right. Now, what's interesting is that Rat, Rapture has a really passionate group of followers who just absolutely they're, they're just screaming out for more of that product but it's a small market you said you know hard science fiction is a small market you're absolutely correct um on the flip side high space which is there uh high space is absolute i i, I term it science fantasy it, it it's it's a huge bathtub in which we poured lots of science fiction tropes and it is basically you know pulp science fiction set in in ultra ultra tech we made the decision as soon as you want to go and do science fantasy, let's go the whole hog. Let's go you know, ultra science, well beyond Star Trek, well beyond Star Wars. Let's just go mad. And everything has a pseudo scientific reason, but it is really, it's just, it's magic under another name. Right. Um, and it's incredibly fun to play, but it's a different experience. And 
you know, if I'm wanting to do horror, I want to keep it close to the close to the bone, close to what we can imagine as real. If you want to do fantasy, you want to have basically, you know, that adventure in space, that pulp in space, go to the opposite end of the spectrum. Um, they right. are actually similar in that at some point you have to do hand waving. Right. It's it's like Star look, Star Wars is Star Wars is a complete fantasy, you know. It, I and, love Star Wars. And, I do. I like Star Wars. I've I've discovered recently that I'm not the biggest Star Wars fan, but I do like it. I like the universe more than I like the movies. Let's put it that way. I I really do. I love the Star Wars universe. The movies, eh, they're all right. Um, I love the Star War. I love the Star War. Right. So so so. One of the things that really kills me about Star Wars, I mean, and this, it really takes me out of out of the the whole thing. I'm just kind of like, God damn it, this it bothers me. You know, they have cyber limbs. You know, like Luke Skywalker has a cyber hand, right? And it's just like, so you can travel faster than light. You have anti-gravity and artificial gravity. And we can almost grow new <laughs> limbs right now. Right now. You know? And I'm like, you're killing yeah, I me. Know. I love it. No. I love it. it it's, it's, it's insanity. Um, but but why? You know, it, how, how come... How come also when when you go to the force light, when you go to the force and you die off, your hand goes with you? That yeah. doesn't drop off, right? Well, yeah, because <laughs> exactly. I didn't see that one. <laughs> That's great. I didn't That's catch great. that. <laughs> yeah, it, That's that a spoiler. That's them. a spoiler. Sorry, spoilers. <laughs> oh, well, please. And then, same, same thing with Darth Vader, right? When he fs away, there aren't like limbs and shit laying right. there. Right. It's like I, I. It's um, maybe it's respirator you know and all. Just hey, hey look, hey Joe, I, I'm gonna, I'm gonna game it for you. I'm, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna do the, I'm gonna do the pseudoscience gaming for you, to get those limbs to work well. And when they've been with you for a long time, they attune to your body force, so that when you do ascend into the force, you take them with you because they have been attuned to your uh, whatever. I don't know. Sure. He, 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 here's, here's my take on this one. I don't mind as, as soon as something becomes it's fantasy. Everything is an allegory. So you know, storytelling is that Luke has his hand as he has it because and Darth Vader because they have lost part of their humanity. Mm -hmm. uh, oh, that's okay. literally what that represents. Agreed. And I think that you know, humans are really good at listening to a story as an allegory. It's what we do naturally. Our Bible is entirely that. Um, most, most of all of the epics, like the Odyssey, are huge allegories for, for a journey through life. We're really good at that. In fact, if those are missing from a story, it doesn't make a lot of fun. Right. Unless it's horror, in which case the, heart, the allegory of horror is that reality is more horrible than we think and mm. we'll do anything to survive. Um, so you've got to look at what the story is being told. But, you know, Star Wars is, at a heart, a fairy tale. And it's a glorious fairy tale, and I, and I love it for that. Um, I actually did like the last movie. It's not a movie without flaws, uh, but I, I enjoyed it more than I think some fans, certainly more than my wife. She was... Same here. <laughs> Take me to see more. But mind you, the best movie of last year, the best movie of last year for me was Thor Ragnarok. I mean, talk about science yeah. fantasy. Yeah. That nailed yeah. it. This was brilliant. Yeah, it was good. That was awesome. That was good. It was, it was geek it was, opera. It was, it was geek opera. <laughs> All right. All right so, all right. Uh, Peter, we bowed out of time because I want to. Okay. What? What's it? You go ahead. Go ahead. Say. No, I was just going to say before we move on or uh, hit the ending, I just wanted to give Joe a little bit of a shout out in case you are a role player and you wanted to check out Rapture or High Space, uh, all of Joe's stuff. Uh, who is through? Uh, where is it again? Who are you through? Storyweaver Games. W Stories. W Storyweaver .com. There you go. And right. now you can get his stuff at Drive Through RPG, I'm sure, on the website, as yep. well as Goodreads. Uh, and go to Goodreads or give him, give Joe and all his works a good review because why not? He deserves it. He he uh, and sacrificed his time to come here and talk to us. We is the least we could do is do something for Joe and give him a good review. Okay. And and I gotta tell you, yeah. And we talked about this. And Mike, while I'm doing this, do me a flavor because I forgot to do this. Look up when he was on when when Joe was on our show before. What episode that was? Because I want people yes. to go back there because we went into depth on on Rapture and we went into depth on High Space and and we talked about uh, ha is it Hail? Is that how you say it? Yeah, hail. Yes, hail. hail. Yeah, okay. Which we talked which, in... which we're preparing for print. Woohoo! Trying to get oh, that, cool, cool. Get that product in print. Yeah, cool. Well, we talked about that in in, um, in 
in detail. And those games, Rapture, we only touched on it here, but Rapture is, is such a cool concept. I mean, the Rapture here happens on Earth, and all of these space colonies are like, where'd Earth go? They, they just disappear. Like, the planet's still there, but, like, their communication with it just disappears. And everybody's freaked out, And but ships come from Earth, and it's like, uh-oh, what does this mean? And there's, you know, there's literally demons on Earth, and they want to get to the rest of the humans. It's cool stuff. Well, actually, be careful. There's not literally demons on Earth because no, demons right. don't exist in the Bible. Okay, it's it's ah, no, is, it, ah, is it malevolent yeah, spirits? It's 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 far more it's yeah, unclean spirits. It's far more unclean subtle. Spirits. Uh, we, right. You know, it really was. If we were going to treat science with huge respect, we also tr- treated theology with huge respect, and we were really right. careful. So there are some unwritten things in that book about what version of the Bible, at what point did it become corrupted, right. um, okay. if you believe in inerrancy. So there's all of that in it. Um, mostly the horror comes from people doing awful things to other people because they don't know what's going on. <laughs> right. <laughs> well, that's the thing, because you're scared. You know, th- these ships yes. are coming, and, and, the, and the people, they look like people, right? But they, but they may not be. And that's that scares the shit out of people. You know, it, it, Mike and I, we, remember we, when we play, we call it the Meller Factor because there was oh, a game yeah. that we play that we really like. Mm-hmm. And these Mellers are, are doppelgangers. And the yeah. second, the literally the second someone thinks that one of them might be a foot, all, all hell breaks loose. Because yeah. everybody's like, yep. oh, my God, are you a Meller? Are you a Meller? You know, it's and it's like, yeah. you know, I've seen you. You've seen it, Joe, right? Yeah, it sounds like the thing. I mean, I just love. Yeah, that's one of my just like things. that. John Carpenter's yeah. the thing. Oh, brilliant! It, it, and it, it, Joe yeah. was on, and for our Story Weaver episode, that was uh, season four, episode six, four oh six. Check that out on uh, Mythwits on YouTube, as well. Yeah, Fantastic. it's a good Thank episode, you. real good episode. So. So Joe, I'm gonna uh, one tiny last little thing before we go. We got to, uh, you know, we're, we're running up on time, but I just wanna one more thing I wanna bring up is, um, cause cause I'm doing it at work, and let's just keep it real quick. Uh, I did a game for the army that's a training. It's it's literally a game that they play, but it's it's built around training. So um, there aren't a whole lot of rules in it. The rules are on how to set it up, but the exercise is run to help train the. Um, uh, People, I, I can't go into detail what it's what it's training, but it's it's uh, it's training people how to do something in the army, uh, and they literally LARP role play this thing with a board, and you know pieces that move around on the board, and they're given like cards and stuff that that indicate events and everything, and they are supposed to 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 respond and set it up the way they really would out in the field, and generals are looking at this and they're very excited about it because they see the training value in this and this is this is a physical board with physical pieces there's no electronics to it at all and i know electronics have been big in training uh military these days which and they have their place but it looks like they're coming around they're coming around to us and they're saying oh crap we can actually teach very valuable lessons with this uh what is your because you, you mentioned this what are your experiences in this well, actually, this is, this does cut to my, my PhD sort of areas. Um, look, we know full well, and, and there's increasing bodies of research from people like Fiona Kerr, that uh, the human brain interacts with an electronic um, interaction, even one like we're having now, very differently from how we interact with a physical one, say a piece of paper or a game board. It's no surprise to me that uh, board gaming is growing rapidly at the moment. As we become more isolated due to social media, there's still this natural human hunger to reach out and have physicality with other people. Um, these are things which don't neurologically are different interactions. And um, uh, we're seeing this in education with, uh, with children who are typing versus children who are handwriting. And there are fundamental benefits from having both, but certainly having the old school, you know, the more physicality. So that doesn't surprise me. Um, I'm extremely, um, I've run gaming in hospitals for children who are undergoing uh, treatment, uh, particularly um, treatments around um, uh, eating disorders, which also couple with challenges around being able to engage in society and make decisions and a whole range of things. We know that board gaming and we know that role-playing games has a positive impact. We don't know how much, but we we can see that it's got a positive impact. And that's been documented all around the place. I think it's fantastic, and I think that there's going to be a lot more of that. Um, The human factor. You know, we talk about all this AI and all this other stuff. At the end of the day, there's a whole range of roles that are humans 
um, we're clan animals, we're tribal, uh, that doesn't go away. The meat in our brain still craves that. And uh, one of the reasons why I'm, I'm very excited about the rebirth of tabletop games, and in fact, we are trying to expand quickly our market presence from a very narrow market around high space, which is the traditional male gamer. Sorry, you know, we do have a strong yeah. male bias there, about 87%. Yeah. That's fallen down from uh, above 90% last year. We're trying to broaden that to be much more inclusive because it's healthy and getting yeah. interactions are healthy. And we learn from that. We learn from each other. Hey, yeah. at the end of the day, it's all about the HI. Yeah? The human HI. interface. Yeah, the <laughs> human intelligence. Yeah, yeah. Human yeah. intelligence. Well, I'm not too sure about intelligence. It's an moron. <laughs> See what I did right, there? Right. You calling me an Aussie moron. <laughs> oh, Aussie, I love it. I never heard Aussie, Aussie moron. That's good. <laughs> Fantastic. All right. Let's wrap right. this baby up. All right, Joe, thanks for coming on. And I'm going to give the links one more time just in case. Uh, storyweaver.com and a Facebook page, Storyweaver Games. Uh, you know, Joe does great work. I, I love his stuff. Um, big, big fan, Joe. If I ever get down to Australia, I'm, com I'm coming. To, I'm visiting. Um, I'll take you to a great restaurant. Oh, fantastic. I, hey, we love eating, right, Mike? Uh, yeah. Yeah. But there's more likely Joe will be in the states that we will be taking him to a restaurant, probably. I want. Yeah, probably. <laughs> probably. We'll see. If you come to United, if you come to the East Coast, you let me know. Yeah. All right. We'll All right, everybody. Let's wrap this puppy Thank up. Uh, let's do the thing. Wait, a minute, hold on. Wait one second. Uh, okay, here we go. Uh, you've just enjoyed another awesome episode of the Mythwits. We're live on Facebook Mondays at 9 p.m. Eastern time, most nights. Not like tonight because this was a different type of show. Please ask our guests questions or just banter with the other myth fits. If you miss our live show, you can always catch the Encore episodes on Facebook or YouTube. Find us at Facebook and Twitter as Mythwits and check out Mythwits.com. Uh, which I just fixed, Mike. You didn't even know it was broken. I, I broke it for like a day or two. If you don't have time for videos, make sure to subscribe to our podcast via your favorite podcatcher, or you can listen at mythwits.podbean.com. Do the like, follow, subscribe thing wherever it's appropriate, and make sure to share your favorite episode on social media. This would be a good one to help spread Mythwits love over the entire planet. Mythwits is part of the TSR Podcasting Network. Check out tsrpn.com for more cool stuff. Mythwits is a Creative Commons product like and share it all over the places just don't edit it don't sell it and don't modify your genome with it make sure to check out studio187.com for more cool stuff and join our mailing list thanks everybody for listening uh tell your friends to tune in and until next time mike hey hey pete and dave yeah. remember this one these hands these except oh my hands missing see because it's <laughs> I've, I've, I've gone to the force, but these hands, <laughs> these hands so strong. <laughs> <laughs>